All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to Aman, Catherine, welcome to Olivier, Zlati Mira, and uh, Adam, who will be watching the session on our session on EU institutionalism, how the EU works, and how also the EU really works and, and, and acts as a global player. And I'm very, very honored to welcome with us uh, Lucia Kleshintsova, who is an uh, amazing EU woman, I would say, who is running for European Parliament, who is an expert on Brexit these days, who is a woman who has a heart for other women, and who is our mentor tonight. So, Lucia, I am very, very glad you accepted our invitation into this Global Academy. It's the first time in history we are doing this session. So I hope it will be, it will be useful and uh, you can get a lot from, from us and also uh, Aman, Catherine and hopefully Adam and Olivia who would like to will also get a lot from the, from the session. Also Vladimir if she joins. So floors is yours and yeah, enjoy it all. We can all enjoy it together. Thank you so much, Adi. Um, Aman, nice meeting you. Can, can Same here. Yeah. Nice seeing you again. Uh, I think it's actually good that Adam and Zlatimir are not here yet because maybe I can give you a bit of an overview at the beginning of uh, about the in institutional structure of uh, what is it that we are talking about when we talk about European institutions and the two of them know that part of the reality very well so hopefully they might join later. So um, I am in Brussels which is the, in Belgium in Europe which is the capital of the European Union, we like to say, because it's a place where all the main European institutions are. Um, so when we speak about main European institutions, that means European Commission, European Parliament, and the Council of, of the EU, which is like the three main pillars of uh, the institutional structure, which take care of adopting the legislation, which is then valid in the EU. And there is a complicated matrix uh, set up around what kind of um, areas are uh, the exclusive competency of the EU, which means that the legislation that is adopted at the European level is then automatically applicable in the member states, or there are areas where it's a shared responsibility, or there are areas which is an exclusive competence of the member states. For example, um, healthcare or education, or police issues, uh, which are the closest to the citizens. Those are the areas which are in the exclusive hands of member states. So uh, Brussels or European institutions only create policies which help with the coordination, sharing of best practices, um, helping the administrations do their job better. But there is not much legislation happening in these areas. On the other, sand, on the other hand, an exclusive competence of the EU would be, for instance, competition policy when it comes to state aid or mergers uh, or internal market when you decide about what kind of goods flow around the internal market of the EU to make sure that we all operate, I mean, businesses operate in a uh, fair, uh, equal environment. So this is legislation that is decided at the European level. Um, and so it's decided by these three institutions, uh, which is kind of the design that was agreed upon by the member states uh, throughout the development of the Institute of the European Integration Project. So the European Commission, which is where I work, which is where I'm sitting now, is the um, legislative, uh, it's the part of the legislative cycle which has the competence to propose legislation. So whenever there is a demand from the stakeholders or a need on the ground to legislate uh, in certain area, it would be the European Commission which has the competence to do so. It's uh, like the governments at the national level do where a government proposes the laws and then they are adopted by different parts of the institution, institutional structure. So our interest is the European interest um, that we are um, basically representing. We are not here uh, for our own national identity. We are here to propose solutions that are best for Europe as such at the kind of horizontal level. Um, so for instance, I work in the part of the European Commission that deals with internal market entrepreneurship industry. So we would propose legislation uh, that helps industries be more competitive, sell more easily across borders, remove barriers to doing 
trade across uh, the borders inside of the European Union, what, what we call internal market of the EU. And then once we propose this, I mean, there's a whole kind of cycle um, behind this where we cannot really wake up one morning and propose what we like to do, but it's uh, it, there's a work program to this, which was approved by the member states before we engage in any kind of initiative. And then once the initiative uh, has been designed in complicated process of consultation with all kinds of stakeholders, then it goes through a so-called co-decision process, which is a process where the co-deciding is done by the other two institutions, is the European Parliament, which represents um, the citizens of Europe. So it's composed of members of European Parliament which are elected in European elections and every member state has a certain share of the MEPs and it's supposed to more or less um, kind of um, correlate with the, number, with the population of the member states. So big countries like Germany have much more uh, member members of the European Parliament than small countries like Slovakia. Um, and then there is the Council of Ministers, also called Council of the EU, uh, which is the third uh, institution which represents the interest of the member states. So um, these are constellations of ministers that meet on a regular basis to discuss proposals in their area of, um, of competence. So for instance, if there's a proposal to legislate something about agriculture, the ministers of agriculture of all member states would meet in their constellation of council of ministers for agriculture, and they would vote for a proposal or propose um, amendments and then look for a compromise of the text um, with uh, the members of the European Parliament. And so once this is adopted, it becomes a certain type of European legislation, uh, which is then implemented in the member states. And then the European Commission, again, is in charge of controlling how it's done, following up with the member states to check that the legislation is actually put in place, support, designing all kinds of support measures to help uh, basically the member states and the administrations and the businesses to understand and to kind of uh, make sure that the, the legislation, which is oftentimes the legislation is good enough, but because there's all kinds of limits in the system, in the administration, uh, the legislation isn't perfectly implemented. So uh, there's a whole kind of policy cycle um, surrounding the rollout of the legislation where once it's adopted and there's a transition process where we help member states put this reform in place and then help them monitor the implementation, et cetera. So this is the, maybe the first area that I wanted to uh, present you. Do you have any questions on this? Because it's a bit difficult to explain in simple terms, also not knowing how much you know about this. So please ask me if there's something that is not clear or if you would like to know more about certain aspects of this. Yeah, can I, can I ask you a question? So, uh, I mean, everything that I read about Brexit and uh, in context of the European Union. So, what I really want to understand is, uh, you guys build legislation for the whole of Europe, but matters like law and order are in the purview of the police of that or the Home Ministry of Home Affairs of those countries or are those also under the ambit of EU? So who, who makes the laws here? So when it comes to law and order, this is typically a police, army, um, judiciary courts. This is all national competence, but there is coordination mechanisms uh, which create networks for collaboration of these administrations. For example, uh, if you know, there's Schengen zone is a zone of free border free travel. So uh, when you have Schengen visa or you are a citizen of European Union, you can travel across the borders. This means that the national administration, the police have to cooperate and understand who are the citizens moving across the borders. And so when there's crime committed, for instance, there are structures and, and information systems and all kinds of collaboration mechanisms so that the, the police authorities of each member state can collaborate and exchange information. Um, but obviously this is not perfect also because the competence is at the national level. So usually this makes stuff complicated, more complicated yeah. than 
could be if the competence was centralized. So for example, if you remember the period of terrorist attacks that happened in Belgium in a couple of years ago, uh, there was a whole debate surrounding obviously the analysis of why, how it could have been prevented. And one of the reasons um, that make prevention of terrorist attacks complicated is the fact that the competence stays at the national level. So the, the administrations don't always know perfectly who are the people who live in another member state. They don't always share all the information that they might want to have access to. And this is also a result of how good quality administration you have, how good information systems you have, how is the encryption done, how much they are they trust each other in order to share very sensitive information about their citizens. So this is, uh, it's all a debate about um, um, center centralization versus which from our Brussels perspective makes governance easier. And then the opposite of it is the so-called principle of subsidiarity, which is a principle which says that the, the issues should be governed at the closest possible level to the citizens. So where the impact happens, the governance should be happening there. So there's always, it's called a subsidiarity test that we always have to be doing for any kind of legislation where we check that, are you absolutely sure that it must be done at the European level, that it cannot be done more effectively at the national level. So it's a constant kind of back and forth uh, fight between deciding where to do stuff and where is it more efficient and so now with the complexity of the world increasing we like to think that in order to be responsive quick enough in deciding you cannot have multiple layers of decision making um, in place because obviously then if you need unanimity for instance the council of ministers um, you usually decides by unanimity so this means that whenever you need to adopt the legislation you need the compromise of 28 ministers and until you find the compromise you are not moving ahead and you cannot put in place the legislation and so the question is where do you find the right balance between uh, being responsive to the global challenges that are happening around us and on the other hand the democracy the fact that you only adopt stuff when everyone agrees and after it was this properly by everyone who is kind of going to be impacted by it um, so yeah, so that's what the governance discussion is always about in Europe. All right. Yeah. I have a question for you, Lucia. Um, what, in your experience, if you were to give a rough estimate, um, how much legislation would you say on average of the member states is like driven from the EU and how much is how much is just the, com the, the countries themselves, member states themselves come up with it. And the reason why I ask is because, you know, part of Brexit is a, what I think might be a bit of a misconception about how much UK law was actually driven from EU and how much was driven from itself. So this is um, a number that, I mean, the, the number doesn't exist. Right, but it's like more than half, less than half, even just depends when on the country. Play with different numbers, also because the numbers can be used for different purposes. So the last time I discussed with someone, I heard something around 80%. But it also depends on what kind of legislation we talk about. So often... 80% comes from the EU. Yeah. So it's a lot, but it also depends depends what do you call European legislation because the two basic types of European law is directive and regulation uh, and the basic difference is that when you speak about regulation it is a law that you adopt and that is immediately implementable in the member state so it goes through this process where the parliament and the council vote for it and then it's valid as is and then there is uh, directives, which we say need to be transposed. And so it's more or less the law which gives a direction in which you would like to see a law going. And then member states have certain margin of maneuver, how they transpose it into their legislation. Uh, so typically, for instance, an area where I used to work is public procurement. So that is legislation which governs how public money is spent whenever state buys something. So 
for instance, you're a hospital, you want to buy a CT scan, there is, because there's public funding invo involved, there is uh, rules about how you manage the process, how you publish, how you collect the offers, etc., to make it competitive for all players on the market. And so there is a directive about public procurement, which basically sets the framework about how, when you're supposed to publish, what are the thresholds that determine how strict are the rules, depending on how much money you're spending, how you have to buy, buy cross-border, how much you standardize all kinds of forms that make the bidding across the borders um, easier, etc. And then uh, member states are given a certain period of time to transpose it into their legislation and there are certain bids in which they have a margin, margin to move. So it's a bit tricky to, to, con to communicate a number about how much is European legislation because it can, when it ends up in wrong hands of a person who doesn't understand the legislative process, they can misuse it as in we want our control back because too much of legislation comes from yeah, Brussels. I think it already was yeah. in the UK. So, ultimately, it's all about understanding and where, like, all of the, the whole narrative shouldn't be about national versus Brussels. It should be about which types happen where, what are the steps of the cycle, and how can each of us participate at each steps of the cycle. Because it does, the fact that it comes from Brussels doesn't mean that you lost control over it. It only means that your minister sitting in the council is voting for it and your members of the European Parliament are voting for it. And then, for instance, if it's a legislation that's being transposed, then it's your government and your um, house uh, transposing it. So uh, what the information campaign that needs to happen is about which are the steps of the process that the interest groups have to have under control. Because now, with the, the obsession with transparency that we have. You, there, are play, there are means in place for citizens and stakeholder groups to, in, to influence every step of the process. The fact that it's happening at the European level doesn't mean that people lost control. It only means that it can require a different kind of engagement and understanding. So a number is tricky. Uh, but for instance, when it comes to stuff like into the market so how do the goods and services circulate around the the market of europe there is one of the core competencies of europe it's the heart around which europe was built it's the customs union it's at the origin of which was the customs union where they the fathers decided to remove the barriers to trade and so for instance this is an area where most of the legislation happens at the european level of course because you want to have one integrated the European market without barriers to trade. So if you want to uh, sell um, a fridge, you produce it in one country and you want to have documentation accompanying it, which everyone in the other member states understands so that they can trust that it's safe, they know which chemicals it's composed of, that they're safe, uh, that there's all kinds of um, consumer rights are, are respected so that you don't have to bother with studying what are the other what are the respective rules in other member states and you can freely trade this one product across the borders and that's what's supposed to be the magic of the internal market that with the removal of the barriers you open up the market which means you open up the competition and the offer is broader and the prices are hopefully lower thanks to the broader competition so do you guys have a single taxation system across Europe? Single what? Single taxation system? No, taxes is a national competence. That's oh, also so taxes are not uh, common across Europe. So no. may Germany may tax a certain good higher than say Britain. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the ultimate urban legends <laughs> when people think that Brussels determines prices and taxes which is not the case. And obviously there are many people who would be for uh, centralizing this because it has massive impact on competitiveness of businesses. If there's different, um, there are some certain bases are coordinated. So like for VAT, for instance, there is certain range uh, as in, uh, and, or rules, for instance, when you want to 
have some countries use reduced VAT for certain types of goods like books or uh, certain types of food, etc. So there are some coordination rules so that people don't like um, countries don't go completely off and create you know these uh, tax paradises in 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 inside of the EU, so there are some rules, but the ultimate decisions are done at the national level because that's where the power of a state is, right? If you control money, you control everything. So this is the last thing the member states are going to give away. And it's a very important debate these days when we speak about platforms, for instance, how do you make sure that the, the, all the e-commerce monsters are pay taxes in Europe and where and how, and how do you, track the behavior like when you uh when i'm sitting in belgium as a slovak citizen and i'm buying a german product from a czech e-commerce platform you know like who actually decides where is where does the consumption happen where does the value creation happen because that's basically right. a basic principle of tax uh, regimes that you tax either where value is created or where it's consumed and yeah online economy this makes um, stuff much more complicated <laughs> yeah so is there is there any uh, so for why i raised is because in in my country uh, about i think two and a half years back we rolled out something called goods and service tax so we have about 30 states in india and what it effectively did was it made it a common market. So the taxes across all states are now standardized. So, so there are a bunch of these products, like the, there are these different slabs and all the different products are charged on a certain percentage, which is common across all states, which allows basically the thinking behind doing this is that then you could create economies of scale and you could maybe have a warehousing somewhere else. You could build a product somewhere else and have a common, common market. And you don't have to like, people won't get confused with so many taxes, right? Because there used to be double taxation earlier because you would pay tax in one state and then pay tax in another state as well. But now you just pay tax in one place and you're good. Right? So because of that, they took a big economic hit right now, but the case is, is being made that this is overall in the long term going to be beneficial for our economy because we'll be able to make economies of scale, right? Uh, but isn't like in Europe when you already have so much synergy in terms of legislation and in terms of laws, then why wouldn't you consider the idea of a single tax across Europe? Good luck with having it passed. It's as simple as that everyone gets it economically it would make sense if we want to like if people have had this in their minds that we're speaking global competition now and that when you speak about like when, if you want to be competitive with russia china us india you better stop playing all these little games uh and the, the division of the competencies at the national and european level you know but this is a very like we people often accuse us of you know brussels centrism and the fact that we live the the naive european dream and that the reality on the ground is a bit different and that's what people want to have to feel like they control stuff and we feel like the fact that you think your government decides about taxes doesn't mean that you haven't lost control to all these multinationals who are driving our economy these days you know so of course it would make complete sense it, not even speaking about the fact that we have now one currency in most of the member states so how can you have a monetary union without having a coordination of of the tax regimes but the complicated aspect of it is that the taxes also come with the social security system so it's not only about taxes it's also about the, the social levies that come with it so some countries like slovakia like to play the card of being cheap or competitive when it comes to taxes so it's that it's a bit of a marketing exercise where we like to communicate that taxes are low in slovakia but it's not the case because the the social levies the other extra taxes that are hidden in all kinds of service operations when you add it up it's not more competitive than in other member states um, so it's a super complicated territory uh, and uh, 
yeah, there's been a couple of years lasting conversations about what's, for instance, what's called the common tax base. So at least if there was coordination of the tax base across the EU, that would already be successful. But it's um, it's very it's very tricky because on the one hand, some governments declare they are for Europe, but on the other hand, they realize that one that if you play with these aspects of the economy, you may, you can manage to attract certain kinds of investment or corporate headquarters to a country. So mm -hmm. a bit short term is thinking from some of them, but um, that's uh, the real politics. No. Yeah. What else? We can hear you, Kathy. Yeah. No, no, that that's clear to me. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, having dealt with tax in the UK, France, and Italy, I mean, it occurs to me as like impossible to try to coordinate all that. <laughs> like that's a, that's a lot. Yeah. I can see the practical obstacles. And it's very complicated systems. So it's a combination of um, the administrative heritage you have in many countries where there's reasons for all kinds of taxes existing and some systems are more complicated than others. Then it's a combination of politics, obviously, and culture as well. Like some countries prefer lower taxes. Some countries like Scandinavia, the attitude to the, the um, quantitative volume of taxes is completely different. The, the, the attitude towards um, the expected service is different. So also the attitude towards paying taxes is different. Like if you look at the, the massive differences in the VAT gap, as in how much VAT is actually collected and how much could be collected if the system was working better. Um, sometimes some people say that it's not even, that the discussion about unified rate is too complicated to get it passed through the system. It would be equally beneficial for the economy if only we collected all the taxes that we should be collecting. So already what, like with the given systems as they are, if we got everyone to pay taxes, they should, including the multinationals and you know all these e-commerce uh, big companies, then um, it would be good enough to fill the pockets of the state without going into the complex tax reform. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert in tax policies, but this is how, yeah, how it's discussed here in the, in the cafes of Brussels. Yeah, even in our, in our country, there has been a lot of, uh, uh, lot of criticism and a lot of backlash that the government had to face. Uh, in order to implement this single or unified tax regime. But the first of six months and two in year were very hard. And there were a lot of pushback, both from the business community as well as the states. And even politically, it's, it's a big issue in India. So a lot of criticism against the current government because they brought in this tax regime, because it actually led to people losing jobs and things like that because mm -hmm. this is became unviable and uh, because what it did was it was basically an effort to also organize the economy in India because it's very unorganized here and when you bring a single taxation rule then what what happens is everybody wants to do business with only people who are as who are part of that tax regime right because if I'm a seller or, a, or even a buyer, I would want to do business with somebody who's on the same system because only then I will be able to get a credit from, from the government if I'm paying my tax, right? So it sort of forced everybody to sort of come on an organized platform, which created like a big econo economic cost, right? But um, now those issues have been removed and uh, now it is actually everybody is very bullish about this system now. So we are hoping that probably the next five years, a lot of economic advancements would be made because of precisely the decision of implementing a common unified tax regime. Yeah. 
So well, that's where yeah, the responsible think. politics comes in. I, I mean, there's an immediate price to be paid always with this kind. Of yes, thing. and in fact, our GDP yeah. went down by. Yeah. Our GDP went down by about a couple of percentage points, and a lot of people credit this tax regime because of that. That they're saying that we grown at probably eight percent or nine percent. Uh, but we only grew at 6%, 7% because we implemented this tax regime. So you're speaking about income tax or VAT as well? I'm, no, no, I'm speaking about, I'm speaking about goods and services tax, like only businesses. So when you're producing something in the country, only that tax, not income tax. Not tax on labor. Mm -hmm. Not tax on labor. Not uh, like uh, the tax you pay. No, not not tax. No, not in that. Not in that. So on, uh, if you say producing goods and services, say if you're making a fridge in India. Earlier, what used to happen was if you have to sell it in a particular state, then you would have to give tax in the state that you're manufacturing it, and even to the state where you would ship it or send it, right? Because you would dispatch it to somebody's warehouse and from that warehouse it will go somewhere else. So you give tax every time it goes from one state to other state, right? And in the country of 30 states, you have a lot of business, right? Where goods and services get, I mean, tra get, get transported all over the country. And then it just creates a cycle of taxation, which makes business unviable. And it also restricts your market. Uh, but with a common taxation system, what it does is that no matter where I produce it, I pay tax only once. And then the next time I have to pay tax, I don't have to, because I'm going to get a credit for it. So it makes things way more easier, but the adoption of something like this is, it comes at a huge economic cost, right? Um, so it creates a lot of short term pain, but it creates a lot of long term gain. I mean, that's what everybody's hoping, but let's see what, what, how it works out. For example, Malaysia also had a single tax regime and then they decided to scrap it. Um, Why? That, so Malaysia also implemented a single tax, common tax on goods and services. So they decided to have just a common tax across the board on all products and services, but they decided to scrap it and they decided to they're probably going back to the previous tax regime. They're probably not doing this, but it's for other reasons. There, the problem is that every product, be it a luxury car or be it a basic necessity, everything would be taxed in the same rate. That was the model they had adopted, uh, but they've dropped it. So now they're, they'll probably have differential tax regime where say a luxury car would be charged at a higher tax and of basic commodity could be charged a lower tax. And the Indian regime, the reform, was it accompanied by a transfer of competence from the states to the whole country of India? Or how was it possible that you, who introduced it, the whole, I mean, you have a whole Indian government who yeah, introduced so, the law? So we have a national government and then we have state government. So we have a federal system pretty much how like you have in US. So you have a US government and you have the state government. No, it's, it's always been a national, uh, national Indian competence to impose taxes, but for some reason you had differences at the state levels. No. So, uh, how it really got worked out was there is a, uh, there is, so taxation of goods and services was mainly a state subject, right? And they'll decide how much they would charge and, and it would be standardized by and large because states also want to be competitive, right? So nobody wants to have a raw deal. So there would be some sort of competitive taxation system, but it was mainly a matter of states and only some products were under the ambit of the national government. But what the national government proposed was that, listen, we'll give you whatever money you guys need. Okay but we'll build a centralized structure of which you all will be part of. And then we'll implement, we'll have a common tax that people will have to pay. And, uh, and that, and that could be completely worked out centrally. Right. But every change happens to the system of 
would be um, approved only after all the states approve of it. So everybody has a seat on the table and they're free to say yes, no, or, you know, or they're free to oppose something that they don't like. But um, by and large, the national government took the initiative to build a centralized structure and make it a central policy because economically it makes a lot more sense. Uh, it will make India a lot more competitive economy than it has been so far because this bureaucracy and the multiple taxation was a big turn off for a lot of potential businesses to set a base in India. So by creating this, we've made the economy far more attractive for people who want to set up a base here. And uh, at the same time, the states, their concerns are also addressed because they get a seat on the table and you know, everybody benefits from, from a tax regime like this. Hmm. Good. You have good leaders over there. Well, we, that's just precisely we want our government to sort of come back because if these guys, because the opposition party has criticized them a lot because it has actually, it has uh, led to a lot of people losing jobs and a lot of economic cost, right? Because a lot of businesses got shut. Right. So obviously there was short term hit, but it's a very long haul kind of move, right? It can pay off, but it won't pay off say in five years. It will pay off in 10 years or 15 years. Yeah. Good. So what are you interested in other than our tax policies? Cause I'm not an expert. <laughs> Ask me something else. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be really interested in where's uh, this whole migrant debate going in Europe and uh, clearly like with Brexit and all that, we keep hearing a lot about immigration and how, uh, <laughs> how Angela Merkel wants to take all the refugees of the world and how Hungary and Poland wouldn't take even one of them. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the noise largely. Yeah, but, I understand. but some people say though that you that it looks like sorry yeah you were saying... go ahead you were saying... yeah i was going to say that the whole migration debate i mean we had the big crisis obviously two years ago when all this uh, the flow started flooding in and then the measures that that were put in place in the meantime put the flows under control so the flows i mean the inflow of migrants uh, the asylum seekers i mean uh, we also that's another question that sometimes in media we mix economic migrants which is who i am as well um with asylum seekers so people escaping uh, middle east uh, africa um, those flows are much more under control now, also thanks to the measures that were put in place. And so the fact that there's a lot of buzz around this in the media is um, oftentimes a replacement problem of real problems that we should be looking at uh, in the news. So there's um, groups in Europe interested in feeding this debate as a replacement of true problems that we should be looking at. Uh, and I don't know, Kathy, I'll be interested to hear your opinion, what you think about this in the context of Brexit, where um, there, I mean, it's happening in many member states that um, Brussels is blamed for problems which it's not responsible for. And when you hear for a long, long, long time uh, this kind of anti-EU propaganda, then it's very difficult to get out of this trap when you need people to vote for the EU. So uh, myself, I've been working on Brexit the past two years and coordinating the process through which we are preparing for unplugging the UK from our internal market uh, and it's also one of the reasons that nudged me to run uh, in the upcoming European elections because I um, have been obviously living the consequences of, of a not good enough communication about Europe uh, and I guess if the communication was done a bit better maybe we the, the referendum would have ended up differently so I think it's um, now a responsibility of all of us to play a different ball game really when we go home. I mean, well, me and Aitka maybe in this case, for the two of you, the, the game is a bit different. Uh, but uh, 
all of us and I keep talking about it with my friends and colleagues every day like what's the role that we can play in communicating about Europe and its benefits for everyday lives of all of us because if we don't if we don't speak up then the other news will take over in the public space and then people will obviously jump on the train of what they're served so it's the anti-EU fears, it's the migration propaganda, it's whatever fear you are serving them through the media, um, instead of having a professional debate about what kind of Europe we want to live in, if we want to be um, a modern, strong, integrated, competitive space. So um, I find that a bit uh, unfortunate the way debate about Europe is presented in the media, because the problems are somewhere else and much more important uh, but it's in the interest of some groups to not put those problems on the agenda no. i have a pragmatic view of migration um, living in london which is basically no one's going to be able to eat in this town in a restaurant a few months after brexit because without migrant workers from europe in restaurants they'll all close Yeah. I think I think it's a solution, not a problem, and it just needs to be managed better. But okay, it's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. It's just unfortunate that we have to be learning these lessons the hard way. And restaurants is the easy stuff, but when you speak about the, the British healthcare system or construction industry or financial service, I mean, all the sectors that are most exposed to immigration force, then um, we wonder like how far do we need to go for people to realize the value of what they've got before they lose it. Apparently so pretty far. Yeah. So what are, what are the biggest problems of Europe in your view? I mean, if, if migration is not Was that to you or me, Lucia? For both, maybe? Yeah, for both. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you first. Um, my biggest obsession is the quality of leadership. Like, who are the people actually deciding and leading us towards the future and deciding which train they're going to jump on what they're going to be dictated as a topic or what they're going to choose for themselves as what's going to be on the agenda and then my biggest obsession is technology and education how do we deal with um, the modernization that technology brings us in the way we live and move and work and shop and communicate these all must be accompanied with legislation that brings rules into this space because it's it's impacting, I mean, where we're going to work in five to 10 years, how we're going to communicate, who knows? And this has to have very modern and ethical reaction from, from the regulatory space, which is not easy. And that's why education is my, my other obsession. Like how do you make sure that you educate kids for the future? that we don't know what it is and how do you make these kids then inspired enough to enter into public service as well. Because um, if we, like for instance, my first job in the European Commission was in the department in charge of tourism policy and digital in tourism. So that, that meant five years ago, um, starting a discussion, for instance, about sharing economy when no one even knew what, Euro, what Airbnb, Airbnb was capable of doing to the industry. Um, and so imagine that you have all these, I mean, you know what kind of people work for the administration, you know how much exposure they've had to business, you know how capable they are of following technological trends. And suddenly you expect them to draft legislation which will decide about the future of Airbnb in Europe and decide about how equal or how fair the the business conditions will be for these platforms versus the traditional industry, which is regulated and which has costs related to respecting the legislation. 
And so if as Europe, we want to be strong and competitive in a global scale, that means catching up with really hardcore topics like GMO, like AI, like, uh, I mean, you've seen Huawei scandal now, like all this stuff that's coming from US and China, we have to have good enough people in the administration capable of responding to these challenges. Uh, that's the serious stuff that we should be talking about. And if you have good leaders on top, it's, I mean, not that it wouldn't be, that it would be easy to deal with migration crisis, but it's, it just flows. So if we had responsible leaders who are capable of designing policies, like development aid for Africa, if we had member states who are, who are implementing the development aid strategies also that they committed to, Slovakia is one of the first countries to, to note that we are not paying the, as much for development aid as we should. So if, company, if, uh, if countries paid as much as they should for the development aid, if we, if we had fair trade with them, if we opened the investment opportunities for them, we wouldn't I mean, have to face all these flows. It's just a question of um, longer term strategies and, and a more broader view of things. It's just easier for everyone and easier to sell and promote in the media if you reduce this to migration flows. But the flows are just the ending of a much bigger problem that the politicians and the leaders should be capable of addressing. And if, if you don't have the right people on top, they're going to reduce it to whatever makes it easier uh, for them to offer cheap solutions to their voters. Kathy? Yeah, I'm just reflecting on what you said. Um... The first thing you said was leadership and I was like, gosh, the leaders in the UK, it's so depressing. Um, but then, you know, the serious like challenges that we have, I think it's nothing short, but in, it's not even a systemic overhaul. It's like a systemic transformation is required to face the challenges that we face. Yeah. It's hard for me to go down to the like the issue sort of level, but just for, I mean, Brexit is essentially, I mean, it's a divorce, it's essentially the start, it's the start of like a dark age for Britain, is how I see it. Um, so anyway, I'll probably move in three to five years. And a big one is obviously climate change which is also another thing that our industries must prepare for. The consumers must be consuming differently. We have to travel differently. For instance, I was at this presentation of a study last week, which showed that the value, despite the fact of how much we're investing into integration of value chains, the value chains are becoming more and more local and less of the share of investment into travel is in the value chain. So let more is produced locally. And so it's all kinds of like, there's big stuff that we have to answer to. If we say that we want our value chains to be produced locally, what does it mean in terms of regional competitiveness? How do you make sure the distribution channels work well? How do you make sure you have the right well-skilled labor force where you need it? How do you train the labor force if you don't even know what you're training them for? Because none of us knew five years ago how Facebook would have is going to be impacting our lives, that we'll be dealing with all this fake news mess, and etc. So it's, um, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's somehow too big a nut to crack. And the only way out of it is to bring new leaders into the system and make sure that you have the right people in the right places of the administration and give them the tools for them to come up with good solutions. Whoever says in the campaign that they've got solutions, I don't trust them because the, the world is too complicated now for anyone to have one solution. You only have to have conditions in place for these people to be able to design the solutions in the right moment give them technology, give them the training, give them consulting mechanisms, give them ex access, to, access to experts. Don't block them with one to three year long lasting consultation process with politicians who have no clue. Make sure you extract the knowledge from the experts and then get it through the system quickly so that you can be competitive as a system in the global competition. So if you say, Kathy, it's about overall kind of over the global overhaul as you said it 
um, it's uh, it's almost overwhelming to know where to start from, and that's why um, I mean all this education we're going through is so powerful because if it if it brings individual people individual stories to the table it just creates the conditions for the system to generate better solutions because it's not about a politician claiming that they've got the ultimate solution to climate change challenges because it's not just about climate change it's about education and nuclear and industrial policy and and whatever there's simply too much stuff in order for politics to focus on one thing only that's why the politics should be about what kind of people do we bring into the system so that we can trust the system's ability to generate good solutions for the challenges of the day or of the year. Because, I mean, migration crisis isn't the problem of the year. So the European elections campaign will be about migration crisis a lot. But the problems that we're dealing with this year is not that. Why is it that? Why isn't it about the crisis of education? Why isn't it about crisis of, I don't know, you name it, whatever, where your heart brings you. So, um, yeah, I don't know. The crisis of work. I'm experiencing a crisis at work and there is a lot of healing to be done in employment in the corporate sector. A lot of healing, but not a crisis. Not Man, what do you think? Yeah, I just want to, uh, okay, so as an outsider, right, and uh, to be honest, I, I'm a, I, in, at least in my country, I'm, I'm called a right winger because I support the right wing party, right? Although the same party is quite left wing on a lot of issues, so we don't even know where we are, where we're on the left, right, or center. Um, but uh, for example, I, I keep, uh, I mean, last, at least the last, two, three years, uh, we've been seeing a lot of these terror incidents across Europe and in different countries, uh, mostly not done by groups or militants, but actually done by individuals. A lot of these lone wolf terror attacks that have taken place and one after the other and at, at rapid succession, right? Like almost unprecedented in at least Europe. I mean, in India, we were we were always used to have, you know, terror attacks, like terror attacks and India was like, it, it, it is almost like a daily or monthly affair, right? Every, every now and then we'll have one. Okay. Um, so it was a very common phenomenon. We never heard all these things happening in the West. Uh, so what, what I want to understand from you is that does Europe have a, I mean, or you has a, uh, like a, anti-terror organization or some kind of a organization that could take intelligence inputs from one country, give it to another country, something like what Interpol does in policing globally, worldwide. Do you have a similar organization for EU that's focused on terrorism or anything of that sort? Because I'm assuming- No, the answer is no. Is this is a, as I said, this is a national competence. So there are investigation forces and secret service of uh, each member state and they have cooperation mechanisms in place so that they understand a bit better what's happening in the other member states. But um, no, the closest you get is NATO. So some member states are members of NATO, which offers them some platform for yeah, bigger leverage, if you will. But no, it's a, it's a national competence. There are some like agencies, for instance, when it comes to migration, there's border security services uh, who help with uh, saving the migrants. But it's, the, it's agencies which implement the policies that were agreed upon by the member states. It's not like an independent body that would execute something on, in the name of the member states. So, uh, I mean, and correct me if there I'm is, wrong. There is Europol, which is kind of one of it, it's an organization for like uh, hunting people when someone's on the run, but it's not the true like anti-terrorist policy making, legislation making body. 
It's really mm -hmm. just only if you, sometimes for the execution, uh, you would have agencies as, uh, yeah, executive agency, which helps you implement uh, some collaboration mechanisms that were agreed upon with the member states, but it's the, the decision-making competence stays at the national level. So has there been ever a demand for an organization like that, where Europe yeah, or I mean, you could know? There are, especially, for instance, one of, um, the, for instance, head of the, the political group that I'm running for, he's a big advocate of federalization of Europe and one of the use cases he's quoting is, is a creation of a common um, anti-terrorism security prevention body whatever you call it simply because we don't have borders so what's the like what's the it's just absurd assuming that we have Schengen and people can move around but we don't have one body controlling who moves around and how so there's all kinds of disconnection in in which policies are truly integrated and sometimes you have these holes in the system because from the design perspective, obviously everyone gets it that we should have this, but then because some stuff is so difficult to pass through the political system, you don't have the, the, the policy cycle completed, if you will. So I'm sure that the fathers of, of Schengen and the internal market obviously had it in on there as one piece of the puzzle that you need to have in place to have this functional, but because it's one of the, competencies that the member states like keeping close to their hearts it, it was never passed to the european level so that's why you have some politicians who believe in their vision of federalization as in naming the cases where the the, the project must be completed if you will kind of for us to be true really strong and really integrated and really competitive there is stuff missing in the design in the division of competence which now prevents us from being really competitive. So, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think there's a lot of resentment against um, migration or against, I don't know, refugees or outsiders, whatever you call them. Um, if, say in the US, it's, it's also happens because it creates some sort of a lack of jobs or you know, migrants taking the jobs away, even if they're really blue collar jobs that nobody wants to take, but at least, you know, the, the case they make is that, okay, it's because there are these outsiders, these Mexicans or illegals who come and they take our jobs. But in Europe is, I think a lot of resentment comes because of terrorism, right? It's not so much because of jobs, because it's not like the jobs that the migrants are doing, those are the jobs they're stealing anybody's jobs there, right? It's not like it's creating some sort of unemployment for the European people. Uh, and but the most some, of the some British feel that way. Member states, you're looking for like in the in some the British UK, feel some, some British people yeah. feel that migrants are taking their jobs. Some oh, all right. the ones okay. outside of London that voted for Brexit. Is, is that is that also the sentiment across Europe? Or is it only a British phenomenon? I'm not able to say, uh, but for sure it differs. It's, it depends on the share, it depends on the structure of the labor force and the share the foreigners have. So if uh, in the UK, you really see that uh, like everyone, like in certain sectors would be non-Brits because for instance, it would be sectors with lower pay and lower added value. So the Brits as a very educated nation tend to be in, in jobs with higher added value. So they outsource the, the lower right. paid jobs to the immigrants, which are happy because they can find these kind of jobs in their countries. So it works for both uh, parts of the equation. But then the question is the broader integration question. How do you manage to really work with the communities and plug them into the social systems and social care? How much you, how their identity transforms? Do they only go to the job and then at home they keep their original identity or do they really integrate into the society? That's where the problem comes in. It's not only about the jobs, like in the, 
the demonstrations in France against the migrants. It, I mean, the colonialism has always been in their identity. The problem is their integration into the society. The fact that they don't even sometimes speak French. They don't, you know, they practice their own religion. They don't practice French European values. That's where the, the danger for the society comes in. That's what people are scared of. It's not just jobs, it's loss of their cultural identity. And mm -hmm. uh, which is in Slovakia, it's one of the paradoxes that we have very low immigration of this mm -hmm. kind, but because of the unknown, people are very scared of it. And it's not only jobs. I, I mean, I, again, I, I don't have any numbers, uh, but my impression is that it's not jobs, it's the identity and our values and the Christian conservative values that would be at threat if you had a relevant proportion of the society which would be coming from other cultural spaces, you know? Right. That's what makes it so tricky and that's why the conversation is so complicated because people are mixing economic migration with uh, I mean, the asylum seekers, uh, whether the solutions are in the domain of humanity and respecting human rights of people or whether they're in the domain of economic competitiveness. These are completely different conversations that yes. uh, policymakers need to be having with their citizens. But now it's just a whole mess. And so ultimately nobody knows what you're talking about and who's against what. Because typically right. when you speak about migration, I mean, the, the Brexit is about, more about, econ I, I think it was more about economic migration, whereas the fear that most of the people are brainwashed with is the security, is the security aspects of, of uh, the security, well, the security uh, driven migrants. Got it. Kathy, what do you think? No, that's a really interesting paradox, but it's, it's been my experience growing up in a rural state of the United States. Um, my grandma ran a farm three miles from the Canadian border, and I just remember her pointing down the road and going, those Canadians, they come over to take our jobs. And I'm kind of like, those people down the road, those people down the road are the exact same as us. <laughs> and the fear, <laughs> like the irrational fear. I'm like... No, Nana, I'm pretty sure they're exactly the same three miles down the road. But like the way she talked about it, it was like, they're the devil. And how is it in India? Like uh, what is migration in the Indian context about? So oh, it's a big issue over here, all right? Uh, so we're a country of 1.3 billion people. Um, but we, we, we ourselves have a massive, massive migration problem. And, uh, but it's internal inside of India or like immigration of? Okay, so here, here, so here's the thing, right? So we share a very porous border with Bangladesh, uh, which is another, which is, so when we got independence, uh, there was two countries, India and Pakistan, okay? So there was this landmass in the center, that was India, on its... Uh, on its west, there was uh, uh, Pakistan, and on its east, there was East Pakistan. And then the war, after which East Pakistan became a liberated country, and it started being called Bangladesh. So, and by the way, Bangladesh is actually doing pretty well, um, emerging pretty well economically. So it's on uh, human development indexes, on economic indices, it's growing really fast. It started off as a poor country like India, but it's growing faster than India in a lot of respects, at least in the human development indexes. Okay. So, uh, but despite of that, India is still the, the bigger country with a lot of opportunity. You know, it, it's, it's like the US-Mexico scene, right? How a lot of Mexicans would go to US. So similarly, a lot of, lot of Bangladeshis would come to India. And, uh, if we share such a porous border, a lot of these people had migrated, you know, over the course of say about 30, 40 years. And that has created 
that has led to a demographic change in a lot of places in India, right? And in some states, the politics has also changed because the demographic has completely changed because say, um, the dominant religion in India is Hinduism and then they're like indigenous cultures, etc. But Bangladesh is, uh, I mean, their predominant religion is, is Islam, right? So the Muslim population was probably 1%, 2% 30 years back. And it's now about 20%, 25% in certain pockets, not in the whole state, but in certain pockets. Um, and in one state, it is about almost 25%. So because of that, uh, the government has passed something called National Register of Citizens, which aims to identify people who are from India and aims to identify people who are not from India. And they don't know what they're going to do with those people, but th at least the exercise is aimed at how do we first disenfranchise people who have come from outside and then we figure out what are we going to do about them. Uh, so now is everyone obliged to register or how does it work? The execution of this with 1 billion people? Yes. So, no, so it's not exactly for the 1 billion people. It's only for people of a particular state called Assam. Yeah. There's just one state where the Muslim population has become about 20, 20, 20 percent plus. It used to be about less than 10 percent 30 years back. Right. So there's a huge migration that has actually happened. And this is no conspiracy theory or anything. I mean, that actually happened because when there was a war happening in Bangladesh and when they were trying to get their liberation from Pakistan, there were uh, there were massacres and there were mass rapes and things like that. There were a lot of humanitarian crises that actually took place. And Indian government happily took these people in at that point of time because they had nowhere to go and we had to sort of support them. There was no alternative, frankly. Um, but over the last whatever number of years, now because a lot of local people feel that they don't have jobs and they have less economic opportunity because of a lot of these migrants coming and taking their jobs. Same thing, same, same issues which get echoed in, say, US, Europe. Same, same shit, all right? Um, it's, it's now really part of the mainstream conversation here in India. And another problem is that we also, for, so in Pakistan, when there was partition, there were a lot of Hindus that got stayed back in Pakistan because it was unviable for them to come to India. And the Hindu population at the time of partition was about 10% of Pakistan's population. It is now reduced to about less than 1% of Pakistan's population. Because either those people have been converted or they've been forced to convert into uh, Islam or they've been killed or whatever. Like a lot of, lot of bad things have happened. So, and not just in Pakistan, but even in Bangladesh, the Hindu population has come down drastically in terms of percentage. So the Indian government had proposed that we would take these people in our country, all these persecuted Hindus, because they have nowhere to go. Um, that And we are a secular country, right? So we don't have a religion of the state. So there is a lot of backlash from the opposition and other parties saying that, hey, why are we taking these people inside our country if you're not going to take the Muslims in? So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a big debate over here in India. So we're also sort of struggling with the whole migration problem. And there is a lot of, you know, daily, like, bickering and a um, lot of allegations being leveled against each other by the left and the right. So the same, the same thing that's happening everywhere, that's happening in India, India as well. So, and in a, in a huge way, it is not just part of a conversation. These, these things actually have real life ramifications because the government is conducting what an experiment which has never been conducted in the world where you're literally counting every citizen and asking them, hey, do you really belong to our country or not? So they have to provide some kind of documentation to prove that they're part of the country. And if they don't, then they're kept out and they would be disenfranchised, right? The idea would be, even if this thing works out, it's not that India is going to throw away these people. But the main question is that, would we give them the right to vote in our country 
if they're not really belong here because they would vote and they'll determine the the whatever the destiny of the people who are really indigenous to that land so that is a real issue here uh, but again it's super controversial because somebody who's actually lived in your country even for 30 years a lot of these people were really born in this country so how could you disenfranchise them which is also a legitimate question so yeah it's it's all a mess right now but but these are really hard problems and there's clearly no simpler solutions so well same thing well well that's what we agree on Yeah, I mean, largely the issues are the same. Like even the climate change is a big issue in our country now, because we are actually seeing the um, the Im impact and effect of climate change. So a lot of changes have taken place. A uh, lot of um, natural calamities have taken place because of climate change in our country, and we have far better clarity about these things than say the U.S. Right. Um, or even other countries, because we, we're really feeling the heat here, right? And literally. Uh, so because of that, uh, and, and India is one of the worst offenders on climate change, because one, there is a very huge population, then we obviously do not have very tight, tightly monitored pollution or emission related norms and things like that. Uh, we do have norms, but those only apply on new vehicles, not old vehicles. And in our country, there are a lot of vehicles which are probably 20 year old, 30 year old, and so on and so forth, which are causing massive pollution, which is impacting not just our country, but also the world. Uh, but at least in that direction, a uh, lot of initiative has been taken by this government. We are now the world's number second uh, solar energy producer. We now have airports and trains and Things like that, which are completely run by solar energy. Uh, so, so yeah, like a lot of movement is happening there, but uh, we're pretty late in the game because we're also one of the biggest offenders. In fact, it, Trump did not sign the Paris Climate. This was magical about India that if you shift, the, it's the butterfly effect. If you shift a small thing, it it, it creates change yeah. at a global level because the impact is so massive in your country. Yes, and the, also the other thing about India is that no matter like what you say about India and you hear like different stories which could be completely different and both of them hold true for India. So while India is like a big offender, at the same time, it's also probably doing a lot more climate change than other countries. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated, but at least we're making progress. We're, uh, we've formed something called the International Solar Alliance along with Micron uh, in 2016. And uh, now the, it has about 160 odd countries which are, who are part of it. So uh, yeah, they're taking a lot of initiative and we're doing real, a lot of real work in climate change. So in solar energy, India will already become the world probably number one. We'll all, obviously, we'll all, already beat China at the pace at which we're going. Because solar energy is a lot more affordable in India than it is in China. Interesting. Well, in China, they also have much worse pollution, no? Yes, they do. And uh, the thing is, see, in, in China, because the government is almost works like a capitalist state now, that's why they they're not so sensitive to these issues. But in India, because we are a democracy, we have to be sensitive to these issues. We can't let people suffer for far too long. And, and it's not like they would not, there won't be any pushback or they won't react. So in Delhi, for example, Delhi last year became the world's most polluted city. Uh, and there were a lot of articles in, in national press about it. And even if you work, we, we would step out of the house, you'd figure out the air is really unclean. And they say that it was as polluted as inhaling 400 cigarettes simultaneously uh, or something of that sort. Like it's pretty bad. Uh, 
but now it's become a political issue it's a full blown political issue so if the government does not do anything about it they're going to lose their chance to come back in power next time now that's not the case in china so in china they would happily pacify the industrialist or the industry uh, and citizens could die or whatever they don't care but in india there our politicians have to be accountable for what the people have to go through so if if they're going to go overboard and they're not going to be sensitive to climate change concerns then they're going to have a political pushback and people are going to vote them out so uh, you have to deliver on climate change simply because you're in a far more democratic country than say a country like china All right, so if you, it's been like pretty intertwining. EU is really EU global player to India. This call, which is fantastic, <laughs> um, and it's really it's given us also a little bit perspective that we haven't had, and we have like another max twelve minutes. So, and Adam joined us in the end. Hi, Adam. Uh, so, so if you have any other questions to Lucia, because yeah, Lucia is dealing a lot with Brexit. She's even running for a member of the European Parliament uh, in really in a really few months, not even a month. So, so anything you would like to ask her, you know, and she's been through many things within the EU commission. So we still have some time uh, if you feel like to ask something or if Lucia feels yeah, like- Yeah, I wanna yeah. ask, how's your campaign going? If it's not gonna kill me. Exactly, <laughs> that's the expression. <laughs> It's uh, it's good. It's exciting. It's um, I'm sure it's gonna be the most challenging thing ever that I've done so far. It's uh, very new to me because uh, I'm you know moving from a role of a member of an administration from a very organized and politically correct space into the wilderness of politics at the national level. So. It's, uh, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's uh, massive learning. Um, but uh, yeah, it always comes down to reminding myself of why I'm doing it when it gets difficult. So I think it's important for people like myself to get out into that space and, and contribute to the quality of communication about Europe because it's getting messier and messier and, uh, and um, there's never enough people who would be kind of openly communicating about what we truly believe in. And so that's what I find is a bit unfortunate that the people who dedicated their lives to building Europe and working for the administration, they are typically not allowed to openly communicate about this. And those who spread the lies and the propaganda they obviously have the whole territory for themselves and so it's a very uneven game um, and i think the just like we're, we've been discussing about the new values that we need in the leadership of the administration and the politics it's also i think part of the conversations that we will have to be having what is where is the borderline between professional being a professional public servant and then on the other hand, an active citizen, because many of us who are here, are, I mean, these are the smartest people of Europe that I've met. I mean, the, the recruitment process to the European institutions, I've never gone through anything more competitive than that. And on the other hand, you don't use this, 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 I don't know what to call it. Like you have thousands of, of this golden gold mine of, of, human potential and people who truly live Europe and you know like if I was a boss of this I would give 10 extra days to all these people kind of kicking them out into the regions just go and talk about Europe instead of asking them to work on future papers or future whatever if we know that the elections result will determine whether we are able to implement our policies or not why would you not use them? Yeah, the wisdom and the commitment that people have for the project, for communication about it publicly. So that's that's the experiment that I'm trying to do. It's very new for the institution. Also, when it comes to the rules and 
uh, what is allowed and what is what kind of identity I'm, I'm carrying at different stages of the process. Uh, but from the bigger perspective, I think it's very important that more of us are more active like this because it's not going to end up well if we stay silent. Yeah, absolutely. Slovakia would be very lucky to have you representing them <laughs> in the European Parliament. Yeah, one day maybe, hopefully. Yeah. So, I would you be fundraising right now for your campaign? Oh, yes. In case you'd like to contribute. <laughs> Andrea can send you the links. <laughs> Let's schedule the conversation, I think, with Aman. Sure. And I think you could really, you know, enroll him into your vision because you have a great one. It's <laughs> better than, than myself speaking to Aman about you because you are great by yourself and you can really enroll and that can definitely be a help to to stay on much more because Lucia has been in my life I don't know almost five years or even more six seven yeah at least six so, so I can really say that she's she's committed to EU and she left many things in this country because of EU but you know you are the best one to 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 enroll Aman because really what I can say is not that high that you can say. I can say only great things about you because you've been like that. And she has also been supporting women all over the world as we were spoken about. And she also has been supporting Brussels community that Adam knows very well. So she really took a stand for, for moving things forward. And I wish we, would, we had more passionate EU bureaucrats than Lucia is representing Slovakia acting so actively because she's visible which doesn't really happen so much with many EU bureaucrats, what I would say, or EU officials. You don't really know about them, although they are there. So that's also one of her big assets. And I mean, there's a reason why all these rules are in place. I'm sure you have the same in India, where public, admi I mean, public servants are not, normally not supposed to be communicating their opinion. They are there to serve, so implement. Yeah is the vision of the government that was voted into the power so this is obviously the case for us and typically we are not supposed to be publicly active but as i'm saying i think the time has come to somehow rethink it it doesn't mean that i'm going to be running around and criticizing my employer or or disclosing sensitive information it's simply being what i'm being kind of sharing the stand that i dedicated years of my life to building Europe, why wouldn't I be allowed to walk around my country and explain to people what Europe, I mean the same, what I'm doing here, why wouldn't every European official be doing it and explaining to the general public how Europe works, what it brings to their lives, why should they care about going and voting for this, to protect this for themselves and for their kids, because that's the biggest mess, I mean the biggest problem of, of Brexit, that the Older, if you look at the age structure of who voted for and against, it's the older generation who voted for Brexit, who want the good old safe space back. It was more of an anti-globalization vote um, than anti-EU vote. And the young people who leave Europe every day, who know that their future is in integrated bigger communities, they voted against Brexit but unfortunately the proportions played against their odds but the well and they had the older generation had amnesia because they forgot why they voted in the 70s to enter in the first place which was economic stability yeah and they kind that's of took the it for granted of, that's the biggest tragedy of democracy i find that these people voted against future of these next generations now it's gonna take years for someone to correct this mistake and the mistake has been done and now i've been as i said i've been living these consequences now of all these interest groups after the referendum knocking on our doors asking for exceptions from the field when it's too late and guys, where were you? when you were consuming yeah like this guy <laughs> when you were consuming all this propaganda before the referendum and the same is happening in slovakia all this anti-eu referendum and anti-eu propaganda and if someone crazy enough comes and asks people if they would want to be pulled out what do you think that we are a more better educated nation than the brits are of course not people don't understand it any better 
but then it's going to be too late to be asking everyone, oh, could you please be more active on social media and share that Europe is actually useful? I mean, this takes years for people to own it. And yeah, I was saying in one of, uh, in an interview the other day, that the fact that I'm here is only thanks to someone fighting for this 20, 30 years ago. And we have the obligation to pass it on, you know, pay it forward. And yeah, I, I get it that it's complicated because I'm an EU official and I have to respect the rules and it's sensitive territories and all that. But what is more important? The fact that we are respecting the rules or that this whole thing is under threat now? Way to be a stand. Yeah. So yeah. That's what I'm trying to do for now. And the campaign is amazing. I'm really looking forward to walking around my country and, and going to places where I haven't been before. Talking to people who live a completely different realities to mine and trying to represent them here even more than I do now. So a very powerful experience. So have you been able to get any, how does fundraising even work in your country? Is it like some corporations come and fund you or is it just completely crowdsourced from the citizens? How does it work? Well, both. Uh, you can fundraise from businesses and from the citizens. Uh, typically businesses have uh, limitations when it comes to their code of conduct. So they have, uh, many of them would have a ban on supporting political parties so then sometimes it would be an employee or a, a board member who would want to support politics on his own behalf um it's not i now that i think about it i'm not sure if it's the companies it's usually the person uh, who is supporting so it's very different to the u.s space because the rules yeah are obviously different but a challenge in Slovakia is also the history that we've had on of years of one party uh, and no free elections so people don't have this in their identity really the commitment to support politicians and they are on the one hand they are against the old generation of politicians who have all the big corporate sponsors behind them but on the other hand, when you tell them, so are you actually willing to contribute to be kind of my new funding source, you know, like, because if I say that I don't have the good old uh, corporate funding, that means I need the new funding and I'm not able to put a lot of money on table. So I need new kind of new sources. Um, and that's where you hit the wall of people not being comfortable with financing politics. And they would typically think that I don't know, did you have enough money or look for it somewhere else? Or sometimes I even heard the f this kind of really bizarre argument that if I want to be the new stand for a new, new kind of leadership in politics, I should show, I kind of lead the way and show it's possible to do it without money, which I find really funny. Like try boosting your content on Facebook without putting 50 euros on the table first, you know? So... Dude. It's really weird how people don't get it. And it's only through this kind of, experience. that's why I also think that the fact that I'm doing it is very important, even if I'm not elected for the generations that are gonna come after me, all these kind of other young women and men who will want to try it and do the same. Uh, because it's only through these experiences that people get more conscious of what it actually means to, to bring the new voice to the, to the scene. Eh? Yeah, so people, I mean, people have no clue how campaigns are built and how much it costs and how difficult it is to fundraise. So the more of us who try it, the more effect it's going to create on the communities to, to help support us in this endeavor. And then maybe it's not going to be now, but maybe then in five years we will manage and bring in uh, more of the new generation to the game. So have you been able to get any corporate sponsors here? Yes, but the sponsors that I got were the physical people. So it would be uh, an owner of a company 
who believes in my stand, who wants to support me in my journey. But the money that he gave me is his own private money. It's not yeah. sent from the corporate account. Mm -hmm. It's sent from his personal account into my transparent account. So it's still, okay. So it is not exactly corporate money. It is personal money. Yes. It's personal wealth, not corporate wealth, right? Yes. I mean, so I, I discuss with them because I know of their journey through their corporate journey because these people are typically faces of a business or of a, of a topic or of a policy area that I stand for as well. But then <laughs> the, the funding source is, is their own money. Go ahead. Lucia, thank you very much and because it's already three minutes past and we, we've been going on. I think it's also useful for you, Adam or, or Aman, to really have discussion with Lucia maybe on a separate way. And it's been an amazing session. I think you've been really sharing a lot of what I got in institutionalism. Aman was sharing a lot, which I think cr created a great space. And yeah, is there anything else you would like to say? Because I don't want to go over time with you and with anyone. Aman has already midnight and Adam is already late. You are late in Brussels and we are over time already. So is there anything you would like to say or address uh, to us? There will be recording, of course, for you from all the sessions. So that's for Zlatimira, Olivier, and for Adam. You will get it. But Lucy, if you want to say some words, please do. Just thank you for the opportunity. I hope, uh, especially Aman, that it was useful for you. A bit of a new perspective, maybe, on what you normally read about. And uh, it was a very useful exchange also for me to learn more about India. It's a space that I know, don't know much about. So, um, yeah, feel free to reach out also if ever you have any questions that could be relevant for your uh, life. and. Ajka, then we are in touch. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, Lucy, I was about to say that actually, I think you deserve a personal driver tonight because I see you're still in the office. I am leaving the office. Mm -hmm. And I think the least I can do is to give you a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm waiting. <laughs> okay, Super. I'm going. <laughs> so thank you guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Lucy. It was amazing. I'll see you in a five minutes. Aman, a good night to India and see you soon guys with the other sessions we have. And Lucia, take care and, and see you soon. Speak to you soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.